Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. James, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, man. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Sure. I'm James Dankett. I'm a psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist from the University of Waterloo in Canada. Now, how did you get interested in studying boredom? It's what we all suffer from. Um, honestly, being bored is okay, but it just makes you hungry. Like you just end up wanting to eat something. <laughs> there's actually a good chunk of data out there that su suggests exactly that, that there's a lot of people that will eat and that they might overeat when they're bored. And particularly, this is work from Andrew Moynihan in Ireland, um, particularly that they'll overeat things that aren't really good for them. So if you give people two choices, they won't go to the broccoli, they'll go to the, the, the M&Ms or whatever. Um, what got me into boredom is twofold. I, I experienced boredom a lot, more so in my 20s and 30s than I do now, but uh, certainly when I experienced it, I, I didn't like it. I found, I, for me, boredom is a very restless and agitating sort of experience. I start pacing around my living room. I, you know, my, my wife sees it coming and she sort of has a kind of uh-oh and, and decides that she tries to distract me and get me doing something else because she knows that it's not good when I'm bored. So there was that, that I wanted to understand it better so that I might be able to deal with it and live with it a little bit more effectively than I was. And the other reason is that as a younger person, my older brother, Paul, um, he had a, a motor vehicle crash when he was 19, 20, and had a very severe brain injury as a consequence of that crash. And he, he recovered and got to independent living and you know maintained employment and all that kind of stuff. But he, during his recovery, reported being a lot more bored than he was beforehand. And that, to me, said that there was something organic about his boredom. That is, something in his brain had changed. How he represented reward or value or, you know, meaning, whatever it was, something had changed in his brain. And so that was one of the prime drivers that got me into cognitive neuroscience, you know, in a broader sort of sense and in a specific sense to try and understand what the brain basis of boredom was. So, yeah, th those are the two main things that got me into it. Now, how, I mean, if you were going to break down just boredom or what you found through a lot of your studies as well, too, I mean, I have to think that it has to be intertwined with attention spans. I mean, people sometimes get bored easier than others. I get bored all the time. Um, so I try and stay busy all the time, hence all the podcast episodes. And also I'm lonely. Um, but but I, I, you know, we all experience it. It might be at different paces, but it is that thing. It feels like, oh my God, there's nothing to do or there's, and it seems like with as much as we have out there now, there's a little bit more boredom. In my opinion, it seems like half the time I don't find interest in Xbox anymore. I don't find interest in TV. I don't find, I'm just sitting around like, oh, I gotta be doing something. Yeah. You, you've got a lot that you've gone through in there. So the notion that there's nothing to do, the feeling that there's nothing to do when you're bored. I think I'd, I, 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 Put a bit of a caveat on that i think when you're bored you can see that there's plenty of things to do you just don't want to do the things you can see so you, you know the classic example is anyone that's listening here that has their own young children you know the four or five year old that comes to their parent and says i'm bored you know what the kid is actually saying is they're saying i'm bored and i want you to fix it for me and so as a parent we trot out all these kinds of options we say you know go play with your legos go ride your bike you know go play with your brother whatever and at every turn the child says nah don't want to nah don't want to and so what they're saying they're really showing us a key part of boredom that is that we want something to engage in we want to be doing something that matters to us but all of the things that we can see that are easily available to us just don't seem like they're going to satisfy right now. So we know there are options. We know there are things to do. We just don't want to do those things right now. So that's the one thing that you said. You also said something I, th I really like the turn of phrase that you used of that we all experience boredom, but perhaps at different paces. I would absolutely agree with that. You, your listeners might have heard of people say that phrase that you know, only boring people get bored, right? Which is a very sort of moralistic judgment about boredom and, and people who report being bored. But here's the thing. I think that people who say that, they're experiencing boredom at a, um, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a fast or slow phase, a very fast pace, perhaps. They, they get the signal, they get the feeling, okay, I'm bored, and boom, they switch away from it real quick. And so they don't think that they get bored very often because they move on from it really quickly. 
but they have the signal just like the rest of us. It's something that everybody experiences. So for others though, boredom is a much more of a slower pace thing. It's a harder thing to, to extract yourself from, to get out of. So that's, that's one other thing that you said. And then I think you talked about attention and attention spans, and there is a lot of good research showing that there is really a tight relationship between boredom, both in as a, an in the moment experience and as a kind of personality trait that is associated with struggles with attention, that struggle to focus attention and, and sustain attention on the task that you have at hand, you know? Um, and we know that there's a there's a very strong relation between boredom and ADHD, which is a, you know as a as a um, developmental uh, yeah <laughs> yeah I figured you might uh, you, you might uh, have a, a relation to that but yeah so you know people who have ADHD do report higher levels of boredom and some of them will report you know that when boredom comes on it's kind of a signal that that they're struggling with their attention and that they need to find something to occupy their time with so lots of great points that you make there but it, it does highlight the, the attention part I think highlights one of the key factors of boredom and that is that you're disengaged you want to be doing something but you just can't muster it somehow I find a lot of times like when I'm in a conversation it keeps my ADHD away from like the boredom aspect I kind of keep going and going and going and matching energies a little bit but then like Bob Ross comes into my life I watched the documentary on Netflix last year and it's around the same time I started painting again I just recently started painting again and I, after five minutes, I'm bored. I literally just want to give up. And I just go, I don't know if, cause I, I can get a comfortability aspect, which is like when you see you're bored, but there's everything that usually, usually you do. And it's just not interesting to you. And I think it's because sometimes you get too comfortable or you're too used to doing the same stuff. So the time you kind of burn out a little bit. So none of it has that interest anymore, but then you try something new and it might be fun for the first couple of minutes, but then even then the boredom kind of sets in. So it was like, is it have to be something that just adapts to a personality? For instance, you mentioned kids when kids get bored, the easiest thing is like, let's go to the park or let's go. It's something new with something that they can't really do on their own, but also you could probably add in the factor of want to watch a movie. I mean, it's that connection whether it's them on their phone or them on their iPad, but they're in the room with you, that boredom is satisfied. It's not necessarily them being bored. It's just they want something added different or into their scenario that they're because we constantly experience usually the same routine over and over and over again. And routines are nice, but also that could lead to a uh, boredom creeping up a little bit faster on you. Yeah, they, routines are nice, right? And, and, and most of us have routines in our lives and those routines matter for a, a really key reason. They, they matter because they're meaningful to us in some way. So, you know, perhaps you, you have the Sunday roast dinner, uh, you know, is a, an, a fairly old tradition. Probably not that many people do that much anymore, but um, it's meaningful because that's when you can gather the whole family together. And yeah, it's a ritual, it's a routine, it's not different every time, but it has that meaning to it. Um, and, and on the flip side of that, on the other side of just novelty seeking, perhaps the reason why it's a struggle to, to you know, get onto your painting back again is that maybe you had an expectation that that was going to come, you know, you know packaged with some sense of meaning to you and it, that it just didn't, right? So the key factor at either end of the scale, whether or not things are monotonous and they're, they're unchanging or whether or not they're constantly changing and they're, you know, forever new, at both ends of those extremes, you're really trying to extract something that's meaningful to you. And if that doesn't work, then it's going to be perceived as bored, boring, even if it's monotonous or, or, or constantly noisy and changing. So, um, and, and we are, you know, there, there is a sense in which as a species, I think, you know, we are what we'd call neophilic. We do like new things. We do like finding new things and novel things to do. And there are, you know, we're not the only species like that. There's some really wonderful work in octopuses that show that octopuses are quite neophilic as well. They really like novelty and, and, and experience. And so you can show that in that species too, they engage in play behavior that suggests, you know, doesn't you can't, it's, it's hard to extrapolate and say, oh, the octopus was bored, so he did this game. But you, you, you can sort of show that, that relative to other sort of species and closely related species, that they're more interested in new things. And so if you are like that as a species where, you know, new things and novelty um, and surprising things are an important part of how you engage with the world, then, yeah, if your current environs don't provide that kind of outlet for seeking novelty, then you'll probably find things to be pretty boring. I mentioned earlier about people having different, I guess, levels that they get bored. But do you also think that people are satisfied or their boredom is satisfied at different levels as well, too? Like there are some lifestyles I just could never live, whether it's just like 
I don't know, my grandparents, they go to bed pretty early. Um, they wake up pretty early too. I mean, I wake up early. I usually don't sleep. I'm a bit of an insomniac, but it's that like, you, I, like what, the sleeping thing for me is like, oh my God, you got to be doing something. Why sleep? You only need a couple of hours, but for them, it's just like, you know, dinner, you know, whatever, so if it's soup and then they're off to bed and their day really wasn't that super exciting. So I'm just wondering, even with the lifestyle uh, differences, I mean, is that also, can you link boredom with that as well too? Some people are just satisfied at maybe a lower level of excitement. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be true. I don't, we don't have any great data for it uh, specifically, but like any human trait or any human capacity, it's on a spectrum, right? So we were just talking about you know novelty seeking and, and, and looking for new things in your environment. Yeah, some people really need that and really need a lot of that. And some people don't. Some people are, are happier on the end of the spectrum where life has these kinds of routines and rituals and that those rituals provide enough meaning and enough engagement and they don't, they don't get bored nearly as easily. Um, and, and so absolutely, I think we, we, we cover that full spectrum of need for engagement and that from one individual to the next, what counts for you as engagement is going to be different than what counts for me. So I liken that um, often to, to something like happiness, right? The content of what makes you happy is kind of irrelevant, right? I mean, and the content of what makes you happy is going to be vastly different than what makes me happy. So I might be happy pouring over my collection of, you know, 18th century stamps. And you might think that if you had to do that for five minutes, you might be just driven out of your skull, right? Um, and, and so boredom is the same as, as happiness in that sense, is that the content of what makes you bored or on the other end of it, what makes you engaged is really idiosyncratic to you. It's unique to you. And, uh, and, and I think also you're hinting at the amount of engagement that you need and the type of engagement that's also going to be unique to you and we do cover that sort of full spectrum so there's people out there that just uh and, and it's i think sometimes we sort of drift into thinking about this as thrill seeking and that's not that's just an extreme it's not about you know how much excitement you need in your life i think it mo i'm using this word engagement a lot it's really just about how how much you feel engaged with the world around you the people in it um, and, and the activities that you're doing. And some people need a lot and some people don't need a lot. When it comes to boredom and growth, I mean, would you consider it a, like, how do you turn boredom into a positive? I mean, I can understand like sometimes when I'm bored and I just start thinking about other things, usually it's called future tripping, which is like, you're worrying about like a future problem or something like that. But a lot of times spending time with your thoughts, I know it's like not a good place to be for a lot of people, but it's also where you can be the most critical, but also you can uncover some things as well too. It's why people try meditation. So I start wondering, how do you turn boredom into a positive? I mean, asking every person to sit with their thoughts is probably not going to be the answer for every single person. Yeah, I love that phrase, future tripping. I'm going to use that. I'm going to borrow that. That's, that's fantastic. What we talk about um, in cognitive psychological sort of experiments uh, sense, we talk about mind wandering, right? Future tripping is a form of mind wandering in the way that you just described it. You know, I'm just casting ahead and thinking about plans that I might have or things that I might try and achieve or things that might happen. Um, so, you know, it, it comes under that umbrella of mind wandering, daydreaming, fantasy, this kind of stuff. And that is sort of letting the thoughts do what they're going to do. Right. Um, <clears throat> this comes to a notion of sort of um, how we deploy our cognitive resources. So if you think about your ability to think and, and it has some sort of finite amount of resource, your ability to think. And so when you're bored, you're not really optimally using that resource and that doesn't feel comfortable. You want to be using your cognitive resources in some sort of optimal way. Well, one response to that is to daydream, is to future trip, is to do all that kind of letting your thoughts go because it's now using your resources and you're occupied, you're thinking about those kinds of thoughts. So I know I do that all the time. I have about a half hour walk from home to work each day and so do, do that twice a day and I let my brain go. You know, I figure out what, what the world would be like if I was Prime Minister of Canada, you know, what you'd do if you if you won the lottery and these kinds of these kinds of future tripping or drifting or fantasy sort of sort of thoughts. Um, so that can be a positive way of occupying your thoughts and, and you know, uh, warding off boredom. Because on my walk to work, I mean, it's, it's the same, I take the same path every single time. It's the same vista, it's the same stuff that I'm looking at. Um, there's nothing really intrinsically uh, engaging about that walk to work. And so I really have to retreat inward and think about stuff to engage my mind. Um, there's one other sort of aspect that people love to try and think about in terms of turning 
boredom to a positive, which was your question. And that is to let boredom uh, ignite your creative juices. And I find that problematic there, and I'll, I try to explain why. People want to believe, and there's a TED talk out there from a woman whose last name is Zomorotti uh, about letting boredom you know, make you become creative, right? So boredom can lead to creativity. And we've just done some, some work on that that shows that it just doesn't, right? So here's the problem. The logic is a bit screwed up. If you expect that being bored will make you creative, I think you're missing the boat on what creativity is and how to foster it. Creativity takes practice, as you'll know yourself from the painting. You can't just expect to stand in front of a canvas and become a, a canvas and become a genius, right? You have to work at it. You have to, you know, get feedback from other people about how to use this particular media, uh, and you got to try and fail and try and fail, and then you know get the, get your own style and all that kind of stuff. It takes a lot of practice to be creative. And you're thinking about something like a musical instrument. I play guitar myself. Um, the first time you picked up a guitar or any musical instrument, you were crap, right? So you you can't expect that just inviting boredom into your life is going to somehow give you a skill that in fact takes lots of dedication, time and training, right? What you can do is say, if I'm bored and I have spent the time developing that creative outlet, then perhaps I can turn to it when I'm bored. So it's a very subtle difference in the logic in some sense that boredom won't make you creative, but if you've got that outlet and if you've fostered that outlet, you can certainly turn to it when you're creative. So what I would say about boredom is that the moment, the in the moment feelings are neither good nor bad. They're just a signal. They're just a signal telling you, you need to be engaging in something different than what you're doing now. And the thing that you need to be engaging in needs to satisfy a few criteria, it needs to occupy your cognitive resources, and it needs to be meaningful to you. And it needs to allow you to demonstrate your agency, that you are the author of your own actions in life. If you can satisfy those three things, um, whether it's in a creative outlet or whether it's going to watch a movie with, with your kids or going to the park, whatever it is, those suggestions, whatever the outlet is, if you satisfy those things that I'm occupying my resources, I'm, I'm uh, finding it, finding whatever I'm doing to be meaningful and I'm demonstrating my agency, then you won't be bored. Why in history, or I mean, just, I guess, from personal experiences, just, I guess if you ask anybody, do you like feeling bored? It's that answer of no, I don't like feeling bored, but why is it just like this painful thing for us? Is it just because of the way it makes us feel or may it makes us, I, I don't know, turn, I guess, go inside of ourselves a little bit. I mean, I like daydreaming. I really do. I do it all the time. I mean, also my mind wanders. I can't stop thinking about the bricks behind you, wondering if they're real or not. Um, but th that's just me. And that's, I mean, I've just always, I've only known that I haven't known anything like, you know, I've taken Adderall once I think. And that was like a horrible experience because your mind just shuts off. And it's like, well, if you look at the way we've treated boredom, boredom eventually starts becoming the question of how do we cure it? How do we make sure that we're never bored again? Um, instead of looking at like maybe a positive aspect of it, I get the force creativity stuff. I don't agree with it. I think it's kind of like inspiration. It just kind of has to hit you. Um, and there's, I mean, I'm watching Bob Ross at two o'clock in the morning. Next thing you know, I'm painting at three and I'm mad at Bob Ross because he makes it look so dang easy. And he also says, but it's hard to be mad at him. Cause he's like, you can do this. You can do this. I'm like, Oh God, you're so positive. I need that in my life. And but it is that kind of like we have this cure aspect when it comes to boredom. We kind of would probably label it more of a disease than we would a you know a positive trait. And I think you know if it's going to be a part of our life, you have to kind of look at it as how do you turn this into a strength? How do you turn these moments when you can maybe decompress from a lot of things? You know, maybe I know people do meditation. I don't think they're bored doing that, but. To me, it looks boring, um, but it is it is that kind of like, how do we get this? Where did this stigma start where we start all relating this experience as a painful one? Yeah, I don't know where the stigma started from, but I certainly agree with you that it has that stigma. I just saw some work um, from from people looking at Russian and, and English literature to look at what are the metaphors that people use for boredom. And they come out with metaphors of, of you know boredom associated with death, boredom associated with the enemy. And so you're right, you know, like people, when they think about boredom, they, they, they cast it in this very, very negative light. I think that the reason why we do that is because typically it does feel uncomfortable. As I suggested to you, it sort of feels to me at least, very agitating and restless and I start pacing and that's 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 not a comfortable place to live, right? And so you think about boredom as something that you want to eliminate. I, I, and I think if you think of boredom from a 
a functional standpoint, what's it for? One of its goals is, is to eliminate itself. Boredom is signaling to you, you need to do something that's not boring. And so if you are successful in that, you won't be bored and boredom has done its job. It now has eliminated itself. But the important point I think that you raised that I, I would also agree with is we shouldn't actually see it as something to be eliminated per se, even if that's its own function. We should see it as something to just listen to, right? So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you can listen to the state, when it comes upon you, when it descends on you, and not succumb to the restlessness, the agitation, the discomfort, then what you're listening for is a couple of things. First, well, why am I bored now? What is it about what I'm doing right now that's somehow not engaging me? And you might give yourself an opportunity at that point to, to uh, reframe what it is that you're doing so that it's no longer boring. And there's plenty of evidence of this for things like assembly line workers, right? Most, although a lot of assembly line work has gone to automation now, but um, most of us might imagine assembly line work to be pretty boring. And yet what many will do is they'll sort of cast their assembly line work as trying to better their personal best every hour of the day. And if you do that now, the work is no longer as monotonous or repetitive because you've set it up as a meaningful personal challenge. So you've reframed the circumstance into something that can keep boredom at bay. So that's one thing that you can do. The more the, the, the broader kind of thing that you can listen to when you're listening to boredom is like, okay, so I've thought about why now, why am I bored right now? But maybe I can think more broadly in my life about, well, what are the things that I think are purposeful and meaningful? What are my goals in life? You know, do I want to be the next Bob Ross or do I want to pursue some other kinds of goals? Am I, am I thinking about how I can enhance my next podcast? Well, what are the goals that, that are meaningful and matter to me? And I, you use the term decompress. I think we don't give ourselves anywhere near the amount of time that we might want to, to spend time thinking about our goals and thinking about what is meaningful and what matters to us. And so if you use those boredom episodes for that purpose, A, you might be able to sort of put boredom in the background a little bit. And B, it's never a bad thing to think about focusing on your, your goals and that kind of thing. And the last thing I'd say about what you were saying about decompressing and meditation, I agree with you. I'm not sure that I could meditate. I think mm -hmm. it would probably just drive me nuts. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've got the uh, the makeup to to be good at meditating. But people who meditate and and take it seriously and practice it, no, they're not bored because and there's various kinds of types of meditation. Um, but what they're learning to do is control their thoughts, right? And in various different ways, they can that, that capacity to control your thought processes will mean that there's little room for boredom. I just thought of this, and it's not like any science really behind it, but it's just a curious perspective you might think or find interesting. Um, do you think it's also because some of the social stigmas that we have? And what I mean by that is, I mean, the lack of like what we can say, like when you're a kid, you're bored, you create an imaginary friend. I don't see an adult creating an imaginary friend. They don't allow their imagination to, you know, try and find ways to help them deal with whatever this feeling is or try and find ways to explore this feeling, but in a more sensational way that is more positive than negative. And then this kind of creativity, imagination, I don't know if it's work, people are tired. I understand that life kicks in and all that, but it doesn't always need to be like that. But I mean, if you hear about an adult having an imaginary friend, you kind of just go, that guy's insane. Um, it's not necessarily true. I mean, the creativity, it's like daydreaming. I mean, if you're daydreaming, you know, people, you know, they'll bump you or say, hey, stop daydreaming. You know, it's considered in a negative way, even though we might have had some of the most positive experiences from it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a very real sense that as we get into adulthood, that, that we are um, implored to, to uh, get rid of our childish ways, you know, so things like a uh, an imaginary friend might be uh, considered, I don't know about taboo, but they, like you say, they might be considered highly unusual. And so people just, even if they wanted to do it, would probably steer away from it. Um, I, I think there's lots of benefit of keeping some of your childish ways, so keeping, you know, imagination open and free, keeping you uh, in particular to your curiosity open and free, right? So um, if you think about something like curiosity, if you're curious about a particular thing in a particular moment, you cannot at the same time be bored with it. It's just not possible, right? So um, fostering things like imagination, fostering creativity, fostering curiosity, I think these things are really important things to do 
um, for us to be able to to lead an engaged life and the more you engage the less you're likely to be bored um and so how much of that is is sort of stigma i, I really don't know um you know and i think also that as you get into it, we we do know that of the uh, lifespan that from your 20s through into your sort of 50s and 60s the boredom tends to to diminish um and that might be in part because we run out of time for boredom in some sense right you uh you might be pursuing a career so you've got a lot of work on your hands you might have you know might be starting a family and you've got all these other responsibilities that you've got to fill and so who has the time to be bored right um and then certainly there's some evidence that into this the uh, seventh and eighth decades of life into the 60s and 70s that that um, boredom starts to rise again and uh, particularly in association with something you mentioned offhand um, uh, that is loneliness you know that people who don't have a great social network in their 60s and 70s and beyond will also tend to be bored which makes a lot of sense again about our desire and our need to be connected um, with the world and the people um so yeah I, I think I'd agree that there's there's some sense in which um there, there, there might be certain activities that as adults we could engage in that would be, would be great solutions to boredom that fostered imagination and so on that maybe we don't because we're it might be seen as being a little too childish have you looked into why video games are just like this giant cure for boredom i mean i get it shoved in our faces 24 7 but it, i mean we could even talk about the 60s 60s and 70 year old people that get addicted to online shopping or just watching infomercials and buying everything on an infomercial. I mean, it's boredom. Definitely, you can tell. It's like they just found a new outlet for it. So, um, you know, I tried to look for more. I, I wouldn't consider that a positive way, spending money on like a, a mirror that you can see through because that's just the window. But that's what they sell on there. So it's two for one. Get it now. Um, so I think even with video games, I have so many friends that, you know, either – it's when I ask them what they're doing on Saturday, they go, I have no plans. I'm just going to sit at home and then they turn to something like drinking, which I, I think it's a terrible cure for your boredom. It does work, but it's not a good positive one. Um, but then they turn to video games, which is okay. I think that's fun too. You're socializing on video games, but um, then you turn to something like spending money. Most people go to the grocery store. It's like you just went yesterday. I have nothing to do. And they just go and it's like you're spending money. Yeah, so you've touched on a lot of different things there. We do know that people who are prone to boredom, who experience boredom a lot, do tend to have these challenges with you know, uh, excessive drug and alcohol use. They, they might exhibit problem gambling. Um, and, and lately, there's been a lot of work uh, looking at what's called problematic smartphone use, which is essentially becoming addicted to your smartphone. You know, you 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 turn to it more and more frequently uh, along the course of the day. You get anxious when you're not with your phone or you don't have your phone uh, easily available. Um, so I think the distinction there that makes the most sense to me is between passive and active engagement. So you mentioned briefly about people doing video games and that there's a social component to that nowadays. You know, I'm of an age where I remember Pong as a video game, as it being introduced, right, and we're playing it on a, on a TV screen at home. Um, I, I think the way in which video games in my era, in the 80s and, and, and 90s, the way in which they were played is very, very different than what's happening now. Because what's happening now, as I see in my 15-year-old son, is exactly as you say it. He can get online and he's playing the game but talking to friends. And he can have friends from all across the world. And these things, um, it has that social component and it goes beyond the game. And I see that kind of engagement as a mix of, uh, it's, a, it's a more sort of active engagement. You're actively engaging with the game and you're actively engaging with the people on it. And to me, that seems like a fairly positive way to engage with those, those sorts of outlets. It's Robin um, Williams joke when he's talking about uh, he walked his friend and through his son's room or something like that. And he's like, he's got four different screens up. That's ADHD. He goes, no, it's not. It's multitasking. <laughs> and it's <just> like, <laughs> it's true, though. I mean, that's I think that also is much like, you know, your price or your spending increases the more money you have. And, you know, if you're living off of a budget, you're very, very you know you don't need a whole lot but then it starts to increase when you get more money and that's the same thing with uh video games i mean you know you're waiting in a cod lobby you pull out your cell phones that's why i cut off social media it's the worst thing you can do for a show um because you got to promote it it's like 24 7 but it's that deal it's like welcome to the digital life the best way you can do is constantly try and increase your success by constantly being posting or doing something like that and i'm like that's boring i am not doing that so you know i posted once a day i actually saw my 
I guess I get bored less off the media device. Um, surprisingly, you would think that there's plenty of other things to do on there, but you get addicted to easily. And then you start wanting to be on it 24 seven, which is like, for me, it's like, that's not a cure for boredom. That's a addiction. That's something different. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you've identified the important components there. So I'll get back to this notion of passive engagement. I think a lot of people, when they turn to their social media or their phones, that they're passively engaged. They're scrolling through things and just letting the world come to them rather than going out and actively creating and or actively doing things themselves. Um, and, it, and it can become sort of addictive. So the work on smartphone, uh, problematic smartphone use, shows that boredom is a driver to this problematic use. So you're bored, you go to your phone, you put it down, you're bored still, you go to your phone. The reason why when you put the phone down, you're still bored is because you haven't actively engaged with the world, you've passively engaged with it. You've let the world come to you. And I think the other place where that's perhaps even a more obvious sort of problem is something like problem gambling, which is typically associated with slot machine use. And so you sit in front of the slot machine and you choose your lines and you, you, you run the bet and it happens and you choose it again and you run the bet and it happens. People are engaged. They can even get into a state of flow that my colleague Mike Dixon calls dark flow because it has these negative consequences where they can lose their life savings. So you're engaged, but it's fairly passive and it's it's coming at you, but you're not really engaging in an active sense. And so that's real and scary. Oh, absolutely. And and, and in that moment, you're not bored, but you're not satisfying some of the things that boredom is urging you to satisfy. So you're not satisfying this need for agency, really. You're not satisfying the need to, and you're not satisfying the need for meaning. And so I think that those kinds of, you know, I, I, I really try and resist, uh, want to resist being, you know, a person who sort of shouts to the rooftops that, you know, the internet ruined my brain because I don't think it did. I think that the internet and social media have provided wonderful outlets for a lot of different things, like the fact that you and I are communicating now across large distances, having a conversation that we otherwise couldn't have had 20 years ago, right? So there are great things that come from the internet and from social media, but we have to choose how we engage with them. We have to choose how we interact with them so that we are being the agents. Um, and in that instance, if you're doing that, if you're consciously choosing how you engage with the, these media um, and, and how you, you incorporate them in your life, then I don't think you'll be bored. And I think you'll also have lo much lower risk of being addicted to them. Do you think that like for instance, like my buddy, he you know he travels a lot. He's got a lot of money, so he can do that type of thing. I call him up one day. I'm like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I'm in Canada." I'm like, "You're in Canada?" And he's like, "Yeah, I'm getting this Canadian bacon that they talk about." I'm like, "It's just ham. It's just ham. Doesn't make sense." But that's what he does. And I'm like, "Well, that's because he's bored. You know, he gets bored and he wants to travel and he wants to experience. I mean, that's his. Per I mean, he can do whatever he wants. He's you know, he's a free person. He can do whatever he wants. But that, to me, that's just like, I mean, does it force travel? Does it force new experiences? Does it also, I mean, there's plenty of times that boredom has caused some really good memories or really spontaneous things as well, too. I mean, that idea of like, oh, if we're bored, we got to do something real quick to get over it. I'm like, I mean, if you wait on it, it's like a tattoo, you know, the only idea only keeps getting better and better and better. Eventually, you're going to think of something that's going to be way more fulfilling than, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. That, that, um, you, you can sort of resist that urge to do the impulsive kind of thing. And there is some data out there that suggests that people who are prone to boredom can tend to be more impulsive and they can tend to engage in, in more risk-taking sort of behaviours. So uh, so we know that that's, that's the case. And I would agree with you that if you just take time and have a, a pause, then you might come up with better ideas for engagement, better ways to sort of spend your time and your, and your resources. Um, yes, you know, that this is one of the, key conundrums or the key problems of boredom is in some sense it's objectless that is that when you're bored you know you want something but you don't know what you want you know you don't want the things that are in front of you and so it doesn't have this object to it it doesn't have this thing that you can reach out and touch and say that's what's making me bored or that's what I want that will fix my boredom it's just this sort of empty space of the empty space that you want to fill somehow um, and so you can fill it with impulsive kind of things like the online shopping you mentioned or eating overeating unhealthy snacks um there's there's some suggestion too of um boredom being a driver for for online porn addiction and that kind of stuff as well um or you can as you say just try and take a pause try not to succumb to the negative feelings that are accompanied with being bored and think more carefully about some positive outlets for you so boredom doesn't do the work for you 
of figuring out what to do next. It just tells you you have to figure out what to do next. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why it's as uncomfortable as it is, because it's pushing you to do the work. And you, you know, maybe in that moment when you're bored, there's some resentment about that. I don't want to have to do the work, right? I'd like, I'd rather the world come to me. Do you notice that when we're in pain, we try and find ways to experience just to get to stop? It's never about experiencing the opposite effect where this pain turns to pleasure. You know what I mean? Like it's that, like, I want to, I don't want to feel this bad. I want to feel really, really good. But if you look at boredom, what are the things you just, you listed off porn addiction. There's food addiction. Those are all things that bring pleasure. It's funny how our brain looks at that as like the first thing to think of. I mean, when you said porn addiction, I was thinking of my head masturbation. I, I, I know how many times people have done something like that out of boredom. And I just go, I mean, but it's pleasure. It's a good experience. It's what pe- food's the same thing. It gives you a different experience in a different way, but it's, you know, that's why I say food gasm or something like that for your mouth. I don't know, but that's a, there's this pleasure seeking pleasure because this experience of boredom is associated with pain, but it's not a pain of like, I just want this to end. It's just, I want to find something that's going to make me really, really happy and the opposite of this. Yeah, so the literature that's looked at the association between boredom and 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 the use of internet porn shows exactly the same. The, the thing that you suggested that that people who um, go to internet porn out of boredom also tend to have increased uh, self stimulation, masturbation uh, events as well in their lives. I think the thing that I would say across all of those spectrums, those kinds of things, and overeating and, and online shopping and that kind of stuff, is that it may not be about necessarily seeking pleasure, seeking the opposite end of the spectrum to what boredom's doing. It might be more about, and this is a fairly subtle distinction, it might be more about avoiding the negative, right? So there's work from, again, Andrew Moynihan and Eric Igu that, um, and, and their colleagues in, in the, um, Ireland that suggest that, indeed, people go to these things, overeating, online porn, uh, there have been a few other things that they've done, their group, not because they're seeking pleasure, but because they're trying to avoid boredom and for a very specific reason. So they're not just trying to avoid the uncomfortable feeling of boredom, but they're trying to avoid the existential angst that comes packaged with boredom. So what do they mean by that? They mean that when we're bored, it sort of highlights to us that most of what we've got around us is kind of meaningless. Right. And this is this existential philosophical crisis that you have. It's like, well, if I don't find meaning in A, B, and C, and I can't find D that it is meaningful, and everything lacks meaning and it's all bullshit. And so then I'll, I, and that's confronting. That's really uh, challenging to the individual to, to have to face up to the meaninglessness of, of much of what we have in front of us. And so I'll avoid that. And one good way to avoid that is to occupy myself with pleasurable things. Right. So it's not the seeking of the pleasure. It's the avoiding of the existential crisis. Well, that's like a perspective thing. I mean, it goes back to what you said in the beginning about how, like, I guess we're looking at it. Um, I mean, if you look at like if you're bored and you start examining things around your life, like why is nothing bringing me happiness anymore? You immediately start thinking that there's a depression problem. It gets associated as depression. It gets associated. And it's, it. I mean, you can bore it down to the basic details. If you're sitting in your room, what you're on a bed that costs however much list off the price. And, you know, you start examining a bunch of objects and start looking either at values or looking at worth. And it starts kind of opening up to like, man, I need to get my life together. And it is that existential crisis. And we're in a giant part in our society. I think mostly my generation probably uh, is experiencing a lot of that, at least people in their twenties or something. Um, Cause there is a whole pressure of what to do. Where are you going to go? How are you going to get there? What's the way to success? Especially in my mind as well too. It's the same thing. Um, but it's that perspective. And it's like, well, it brought you this. It, you had a different experience yesterday when you were sitting on your couch watching TV why is it so different today? And I think you can examine some things, but I don't know if it necessarily leads inward. I think it's just about, I honestly couldn't give you an answer. Yeah, I, why, why it, it descends upon you, why you have that existential crisis on one day and not the next or from one moment to not the next is a really interesting question. But I, I think, so I, I have a colleague, he's a philosopher at the University of Louisville, um, Andreas Alpadori, who does a lot of work on boredom. And he, he wrote a book called Propelled, and he talks about three different emotional states. He talks about frustration, boredom, and anticipation. And what he wants to do in terms of putting those three things together is to suggest that the good things about all three of them is that they propel us. They keep us in motion, right? So when you're frustrated by something, 
that's actually a signal that you're wanting to keep going to get past the frustration. Whatever the roadblock is that's got in front of you right now, you're you're driven, you're motivated to get past that roadblock. If you're bored, you, you're, you're wanting to get in motion to find something that you're not bored by, find something you're engaged by. And then one that sort of stands out as a bit of an odd one of that triumvirate is anticipation. But he sort of suggests that when you are anticipating, you know, a thing in the future that's going to be uh, in, engaging, interesting, rewarding in one sort of way, that propels you toward it, that makes you move and get in motion towards it. So if you take that idea, and I quite like that idea, I think it's a really good notion. Um, if you take that idea and, and think about it, then that might be one of the explanations for why some days you do and some days you don't have these existential crises. The days in which you don't, you're just in pretty good motion. You're moving from one activity to the next. You, you, you're um, not struggling in the downtimes between activities to, to figure out what you're going to do next. You just, you're in motion and your, your life and your thoughts are all in a fairly smooth and, and, and well-paced for you. Because as I like that notion you brought up earlier about the different paces at which we experience thought, the different paces at which we, we engage with the world. So, you know, the pace is working for you. The engagement is working for you. It feels maybe a little bit effortless. And so you're not going to have the existential crisis because you're in motion. Right. And then the next day, some of that's lost somehow. You're not the 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 the, the downtimes between tasks are, are longer or or they're not um they're not as easy for you to get out of and figure out what the next thing is that you want to do. And now that opens up time, space for your thoughts to turn to those existential crises. Do you think that if we taught this in schools when it comes to like younger youth? Um, they, we might be better equipped to handle it when it does happen or maybe not fear it as much too. I mean, that stigma that we attach to it, it's, it's just because nobody taught us how to deal with it when it does approach us. Um, and I feel like with education, like much like you're giving me some insight on how some things relate and stuff like that, it's helping me understand it more. And I'm sure through your work, you've probably been able to understand it to a certain degree. And also you might have some questions on some things as well too, but I feel like it starts with the education aspect. I would agree. It, you know, it gets back to that notion that I, I think a lot of parents have said to their children when the children come to them and say they're bored. You know, Go play a in lot traffic. of parents. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of parents have said that you know only boring people get bored, and that is that sort of judgment and stigma, and and you know, and then we, and, and as you say, you know, we might develop this kind of taboo around it or this fear of it and this negative. So I agree with you. I think we could do a lot more better in avoiding those that kind of stigma, avoiding that moralizing concept about boredom and instead sort of finding ways to encourage the child to figure out their own way through it because what we can't do is just be the agent for them we can't sort of say okay well i know you're bored that's i'm sorry about that little johnny let's do x right you can't do that because that's taking little johnny's agency away from him right so instead what we want to say oh you're bored are you that's interesting and so sort of just have them pause and think about it and discuss it the other thing to do that I think on an education sort of sense, and, and there's some uh, there's a small amount of data that came out of the pandemic suggesting that people who had a plan for their boredom during the early stages of the pandemic coped better. And I think that's an important thing to take forward with children to say, okay, let's talk about your boredom, but while you're not bored, let's write down a plan for it. What are the five things that you think are never boring? And, you know, let's turn to those and put the list up on the wall. And now, you know, when you're bored, you don't have to come to me. You can go to your list and you made the list and you outlined those five things. That kind of positive um, uh, planning ahead for it, I think, could be a really good thing for helping kids cope with their boredom. And then setting for me, too, I think is just setting appropriate expectations. You've talked about painting. I mentioned, um, you know, that I play guitar. Gu guitar for me is my go to boredom solution. Right. So I played since I was about 12 or 13. Not very good, but I enjoy it. Um, and I and it and it is a creative outlet for me too. I tend to write my own songs rather than playing other people's songs. So if I'm bored, I'll go to it. But I think you have to have appropriate expectations. It is not a hundred percent successful. And it seems like as you were saying about your own painting, that's true for you too, right? Sometimes I'll turn to the guitar and it'll be beautiful. It just, you know, I get into the zone with it. I enjoy the things that I create, I enjoy playing things that I've already created and that I know. Um, and then boredom's just dissipated and it's gone. Sometimes I'll pick up the guitar and I'll start fiddling around and playing across scales and, I'll, and I'll still be bored five minutes later and I'll have to put the thing down because it hasn't worked. So we have to set, I think, particularly for children. I mean, I don't think this is such a big deal for adults, but for children, I think we have to set 
uh, realistic expectations. So you set out your plan, but you know, don't just abandon your plan because the first option didn't work. Go to the second on the list. And if that didn't work, you know, calm down, take a breath, go to your third thing on the list and see how that works. So I, you know, I don't know if those things are going to be that sort of planning ahead, having giving the child agency in their own plan, um, and, and then trying to teach them to not you know, succumb to the restlessness, the agitation. I don't know if those things are going to work because we haven't done the studies, but I certainly think that they're, they're good solution, good suggestions to try. Were you able to pull out good information from the pandemic? Like what age ranges, did you do any studies to see what age ranges experience um, boredom? I would have to feel like a lot of that would just be worry, especially older ages as well too. I mean, the business aspect, the money aspect, um, it wasn't really, I mean, for kids, it was like you get to be off school for however long um, and play video games all the time. So, I mean, that kind of, eventually maybe towards the end they got a little bit bored but i feel like the first couple of months it would have been like when we had a really bad snow day we didn't get to go to school for like two weeks it was but what bills kind of increased the worrying factor right yeah so so the data that we collected and i think the data that i'm aware of from other labs too uh mcwellen todman and his group did, did some uh some work on this is mostly in adults and so the range, and it's quite a big range um so you know anywhere from sort of 17 18 year olds to, to 60 year olds but we didn't capture the kids so and there's some work out there i think but i'm not as familiar with what they found in in you know people younger than 17. um and you're right to say what about all these other things you know worrying about well how's my business going to survive how am i going to survive um, am I going to keep away from the illness? People who had caregiving duties, these kinds of things probably weighed more heavily on the minds of people than, oh, wow, I'm going to get bored, right? What we looked at was not so much the sort of state or the in the moment feelings of boredom. Did they increase? There's a there's some data out there suggesting that across a, a wide range of countries and cultures that, that boredom did increase as a function of the, the pandemic, a small amount. We looked at the trait, so the individual propensity to feel boredom and how that might have played out for other aspects of the, the pandemic. So what we showed, and, and there was another group from Daniel Wolf and colleagues in Germany that showed the same thing in, in a different, different group of people, that people who are more prone to boredom were less likely to adhere to the rules of social distancing. And the idea is that without wanting to be sort of judgmental about those individuals, is that for the boredom prone, there is this really strong desire to try and engage. And when we locked everything down, that that was just something that they couldn't easily cope with. And so they would break the rules of social distancing more often. Um, there is also some work suggesting that reports of how boredom prone you are also increased over time. And so this notion of being locked down and being unable to engage with the world in ways you normally would made people feel even more boredom prone um, throughout the course of the, at least the early stages of the pandemic. And we're talking, you know, 2020 to 2021 sort of time because a lot of those lockdown measures changed after that and, and were lifted um, and so you know we don't know how much of that has then recovered or gone back to what what things were like before the pandemic so yeah we we looked at a few things and and we also looked at sort of boredom and creativity boredom prone people during the pandemic were less likely to be creative they didn't engage creative activities and that was a problem for them because people who chose to engage in creative everyday creative acts tended to cope better. They did better um, throughout the pandemic than people who didn't do stuff. So those were the kinds of things that we found out from the data we collected in the pandemic. Now, through your research of boredom, I mean, just through the conversation with you so far, it's just the fact that there's so much interesting things about it. I, I would think like, it would have been a way shorter podcast. You'd be like, yeah, boredom, just get over it. Thank God you're not a motivational speaker because that's probably would have been the answer for them. But it is kind of like, I mean, it's, very fascinating when you look at all it really affects. I mean, I think we try not to think about boredom at all because I, I don't know, sometimes when I think about being bored, I end up getting bored. Um, but it's really nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be sad about. It's nothing to be, you know, like, like an answer or a problem you need to fix. It's kind of like, you don't need to be like, it's advice that every you know person I've had on as a psychologist or someone has given me is like, you don't need to be doing everything every single minute of the day. And it, that is true. And there is that kind of like, I, I wouldn't say it's a, 
instilled factor in today's time, but there's a lot of that. Like a lot of people feel like they need to be doing a podcast one minute, a movie deal the next minute, a conversation the next. And I do agree with the social distancing thing um, with people that are more likely to get bored. I did not even think about that half the time um, I was doing it. My fault, but I mean, you know, whatever. Uh, the, the circle on the floor was nice, you know, six feet apart from someone. But it is that, like even in silence, I get really uncomfortable. I get bored. I want to end up making something doing something or saying something or just trying to get someone to engage and that's how people at my work know like you know if they just focus on the one thing and i'll keep talking i'm like all right well i'm very uncomfortable right now i'll just walk away <laughs> yeah i'm not a fan of silence myself I, I uh i i don't enjoy those kind of awkward sort of moments um and yeah so uh, there was something i was going to say and I, so i've kind of lost it oh and yeah so there was this some recent work that I think is really interesting that speaks to a few of the things that you've just brought up there that comes from a colleague of mine, Juan Ann Van Tilburg, who's in the UK. And he looked at, at, you know, thinking about boredom and ruminating about boredom does make it worse, right? It's, it's so it, it sort of makes, the it sort of intensifies the feeling in a kind of vicious cycle, right? Then the other thing that they showed in the same study is that normalizing boredom makes it better, right? So if you can sort of say you know that this is not uh you can um, remove the moralizing if you can remove the negative appraisal if you can sort of understand what boredom is for and what it's trying to tell you then you'll actually experience it less intensely so you know even just that normalizing just saying this is just a part of the human experience part of the furniture of life right and one of the other ways in which i think is a good way to normalize it is that animals get bored too right this is there is an evolutionary history to this that you can show either anecdotally and in some really interesting studies that have been done experimentally that animals get bored. So that suggests that boredom was selected for in our evolutionary past. Why? Because it's a really good signal to prompt you to explore your environment for other resources and for other things to engage in. Um, and so I would totally agree that, that we should just normalize boredom and we should consider it to be this part of our lives that is not something to avoid but to listen to and learn from um and and you know, you know part of that too might be a bit of a journey of self-discovery of of you know how much can i tolerate silences and how much can i and how much do i enjoy daydreaming and and how much do i need novelty and those kinds of things if you can explore those things and answer them for yourself then you're better placed to figure out how to structure your environment to satisfy those things that matter to you right so yeah, and, and just I, I was I meant to talk about this on uh, earlier, but I, I didn't get around to it. This notion of like silence and just spending time with your thoughts. I don't know if you know the study. It's come from Timothy Wilson and his colleagues at University of Virginia. They had people put in a room for fifteen minutes with nothing but their thoughts. So they took people's phones away, took their backpacks away. There was nothing in the room to do, nothing in the room to look at. Just fifteen minutes, just you and your thoughts. And about one third of people said that they quite enjoyed the experience. And this is this notion of notion of decompressing and 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 you know disconnecting from life and having a sort of calmer period that I think some people would really benefit from and enjoy. About one third of their people, their participants said, no, it's just ambivalent, didn't really care. And then one third said, I hated it, it sucked, and it was really boring, right? And then the thing that they did, they had a series of experiments. And in their last experiment, they said, okay, you can have 15 minutes in the room with nothing but your thoughts, or you can self-administer an electric shock. And so most people, <laughs> yeah, most people in that experience um, self-administered an electric shock rather than just sit there with their thoughts. One guy administered 196 shocks in 15 minutes to himself. That dude has ADHD, 100%. Or he's a freak. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other. Um, and then that's been followed up by a couple of other groups, uh, Netacorn and Havermans and, and their colleagues and their students, where they... They did it a little bit more carefully than, than Timothy Wilson's group did. So in, in the Havermans and, and Metacorn groups, they induced bored. They made people feel bored in one group or they made people feel sad. And then they looked at um, they looked at a couple of things that we've already touched on. They looked at if I make you sad or if I make you bored, how much food do you eat and what kind of food? And it turns out when I make you bored, you eat more of these treats than if I make you sad. And it also turns out that if I make you bored, you administer more electric shocks than if I make you sad. So they, they did it in a much more sort of careful and controlled kind of way. But it just sort of suggests that for some of us, when we are left alone with silence and nothing but our thoughts, that that's not enough or that's uncomfortable and that we need to, to engage in things that even in some instances might be self-harming. Um, and, and so I find that work to be interesting as well. But that was a bit off topic of the last thing you asked. I just 
remembered that I wanted to get to that point. That was pretty interesting. I do like a lot of the silence sometimes. Like, I mean, at one o'clock in the morning, there's not a whole lot to do. Um, but my work became 24 hours. I work at a gym. So I usually just go there and just do whatever workout for however long until something opens up and then usually go do something else. Um, but when I, when it wasn't 24 hours, there was these periods where you would sit in silence and you would you know, stare up at the ceiling. Like when's sleep going to happen? I don't know. I haven't seen that thing in a while. And you kind of get this area where you are stuck with your thoughts. It isn't necessarily a hundred percent bad. It's just about how do you start looking at things and not take it so much to heart. And that is a little bit different than I guess what most people, I mean, most people, they don't realize how tired they really are. Um, you know, you work all day, you experience whatever stress throughout the day, and then you come home and you usually go right to bed. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you're tired, sure, but you're also not decompressing all that stress that you're receiving. So it's just, you're going to wake up even more pent up or more in pain or more diminished in some capacity. And that only adds slowly, slowly, slowly every single day. And then I don't know, a month later, you're just upset with life and you're bored all the time, but it's also, how do you turn it when you do receive boredom into that good experience so then now you aren't just receiving just emptiness you're receiving something from it and i think that coming from education you know younger ages as well too kids i don't feel like they experience boredom as easily um sometimes in their house yeah but they have so much like i mean the things my little nephew can do or i'm just like oh god i remember when i could think of something like that or turn whatever into something extraordinary um, building a pillow fort, that sounds boring, but uh, to them, they love it. Um, but that is that kind of, it's, it's a part of us. I mean, it's much like life and death. I mean, they're guaranteed their emotions that we have anger is guaranteed hunger. All these things are guaranteed. Boredom is one of those. But when you think of emotions, a lot of people don't think necessarily of boredom. They kind of think of other things first, happiness, sadness, um, probably more people are sad sometimes, um, which might increase boredom as well too. There's certainly a relationship between boredom and, and uh, challenge, other challenges with mental health and, and, and you know, patients as well. So, that, you know, people who are boredom prone tend to have higher levels of depression and anxiety. And one of the key questions left for us in, in, in the board field is to understand what's the link, you know. So we know that they're linked. We know that they're related. We don't know how. And one of the, the, the key questions about that is to try and understand the timeline of this, the temporal nature of this. Does boredom and chronic feelings of boredom and continued episodes of boredom, does that lead to depression or is it the other way around or is there a reciprocal sort of cycle that the, the two things sort of amplify one another? So there's lots and lots of questions there that are really going to be important to try and understand. Um, but I think, you know, you were talking about this as, again, in that context of normalising it, that, yeah, it, it is a, uh, we, we sort of talk, talk about it as a, a cognitive affective experience. And my, my colleague, John Eastwood, talks about this as the feeling of thinking. Right. So you've talked a lot about mind wandering and daydreaming and that sort of stuff and, and letting your thoughts wander. Um, John would, would talk about boredom as a feeling state associated with your thought processes. Right. So, you know, and, and, uh, am I thinking in a way that's engaging or well, I won't be bored? But uh, am I thinking and this this tends to get to this sort of rumination that sometimes is associated with boredom, because I, I think many episodes of boredom are I'm bored. What am I going to do? Don't know. I'm bored. What am I going to do? Don't know. I'm bored. You know, and it sort of cycles around and ruminates and doesn't get out of that loop. Um, and and so it is. It's not just an emotion, um, and and it's not just thought. It's a sort of thought emotion loop in, in some sense. And if we can normalize it uh, and learn to, learn to, you know, not be afraid of boredom or to to just sort of you know, try and run from it rather than listen to it, then I think we'll be better off. Well, James, I really appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show, man. It seriously was a pleasure chatting with you. Is there a place where people can find any of your links? Yeah, they can just go to, to my website, jamesdankert.com. So it's, uh, it's just my first name and last name, D-A-N-C-K-E-R-T.com. Uh, and that's that'll have links to the book that John Eastwood and I wrote about um, Out of My Skull, which is about boredom. And uh, they'll be able to find ways to contact me there just by email if they have questions or things that they want to ask. So that's probably the easiest way to go. And I'm the same thing, James Danker, that, that is, is my handle on Twitter too. Uh, I'm going to make sure I follow you. And um, I just want to ask one last question for you. Is there certain things that trigger boredom? Like, is there certain objects or I, because we talk about the stigma and society type aspects of things, but like whenever I see the color gray or there's like, 
And I start wondering, okay, then what's the increase on rainy days for people that get bored easier? Uh, the rainy day things are, are complex because, uh, you know, in the part of the world that I live in at the moment, you know, you get shorter days, so you get less daylight. And if you get lots of gray days, you get less daylight and less sort of things. And that is associated with what's known as seasonal affective disorder. And it really is just about how much light you're you're getting in. So you can you can treat seasonal affective disorder by putting a, a pure white light in your office and turning it on at the, the bookends of the day, at the start and the end of the day. And that increases the amount of light that the system is taking in and you'll be less depressed. Um, so that that grayness is is I think that's something that really influences mood and, and the amount of daylight hours that you have influences mood as well. Whether or not it influences boredom, I don't know. Right? And I don't like I said before, you know what makes you bored and what makes you happy they're idiosyncratic and so they're possibly i mean i wouldn't be surprised if there's someone out there who just gets great joy out of gray painted houses and just thinks that the gray is fantastic but not you and i every corporate ceo i've ever met is always about gray offices and gray buildings but all right well i appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show man um, i'm going to link all your links in the description it's been a pleasure chatting and thanks for this episode of out of the blank podcast